This is the first ever conversation between two of my favourite cultural commentators, the writers Paul Kingsnorth and Mary Harrington, and it's all about the overlaps between their thought and their analysis of what we're calling the war on reality. Well, I suppose in my case, I, I've, I, I use this word, the machine, all the time in the writing I'm doing at the moment. It's not my word. It's stolen from writers like D.H. Lawrence and George Orwell and Aldous Huxley and everyone else who was paying attention for the last hundred years. Um, and I'm really talking about this giant techno-industrial monstrosity that is in our heads and in the world, which is really the project of modernity, as far as I can see. And the project of modernity is to build a machine to replace God because we've given up on God and we're Consequently, we've given up on limits and living within the natural world and our place within that. I've borrowed from Heidegger elsewhere to frame this in terms of, you know, of what, what you call the machine, Paul. See, it wants to turn everything into standing reserve. You know, it wants to it wants to enclose everything. You know, it started with the commons and then it started patenting things. And now it's moving on to patenting people's bodies and um, genetic sequences. I invited them to dialogue because I had an intuition they'd be able to go deep together. And this went even better than I expected. I think it's a really important development in the cultural conversation, and I'll come back and explain why at the end. So, hope you enjoy it. Paul Kingsnorth, Mary Harrington, welcome. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So, this is, the, I believe, the first time that you both have been in dialogue with each other. You've both written for Unheard, so you've been in the same um, online magazine. And there's a lot of overlaps between your thinking. Um, so I'm really looking forward to this conversation. And as I thought maybe it'd be good to start maybe with asking you each, because I know you've both been looking forward to being in dialogue with each other, what it is that you are looking forward to talking about and what you find interesting in each other's thought before we dive into some of the topics we've prepared. I like Paul's conception of the machine. I'd be happy to talk about that for an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think we're coming at the same thing uh, from a different perspective. Actually, I really like, I love the catch. I love the notion of reactionary feminism. Actually, I think, apart from being a great catchphrase, it actually really opens up a lot of really necessary questions about, uh, and not just about uh, women's issues either, but just broadly about limits and the body and nature. Yes, 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 yes. You get That's it. Not, you get it. You no, see. I do get it. I do get it because you're coming from a feminist perspective at the same sort of stuff. I think I'm writing about from whatever yes. perspective I write. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The um, moment you start thinking about reactionary feminism, you realise it's reactionary ecofeminism, and then then you're aware. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, I, I suppose what I would what I would say I'm coming from, I suppose, is my background as a as a former environmental activist, but somebody who writes and thinks about the natural world a lot. And you don't have to do that for very long before you realise that obviously we're intimately a part of it, and the whole thing is a question of limits and whether or not we can break them. And then the questions about the body and the questions about women's and men's bodies and the questions about the reality of being human and the questions about rainforests and climate change turn out to be the same questions, which is how yes. we live within limits. Good. Uh, well, we've, that's it. We've dealt with everything. So we've sorted it out. So that's good. Thanks, David. <laughs> Great. Mary and Paul, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's it. That's, that's the tweet, as they say. Yeah, that's, that's a really great introduction. And as, as you said, Paul, that the idea is that somehow the modern world seems to be in conflict with itself or, the, or at least with the natural world. And this is something you've touched on in your writing and Mary, you, you, you've touched on as well. Um, could, could we start by, by framing that? How, how do you see that from the sort of biggest picture? Well, I suppose in my case, I, I've, I, I use this word, the machine, all the time in the writing I'm doing at the moment. It's not my word. It's stolen from writers like D.H. Lawrence and George Orwell and Aldous Huxley and everyone else who was paying attention for the last hundred years. Um, and I'm really talking about this giant techno-industrial monstrosity that is in our heads and in the world, which is really the project of modernity, as far as I can see. And the project of modernity is to build a machine to replace God, because we've given up on God. And we're, consequently, we've given up on limits and living within the natural world and our place within that. And we've decided that through the use of technology, science and reason, we can effectively build a new world which doesn't seem to limit us in any way. And we've decided that any limits at all, whether they're the limits that our body provides or the limits that the natural world provides us with or uh, the limits of even the limits of our behaviour towards each other are disgraceful chains that prevent us from being free and rational and individuals. Um, and so I think it's a big 
it's just a very big, very old way of seeing that is manifesting itself in, in silicon and plastic all around us. And as I say, coming at that from the perspective of an environmentalist or a former one, uh, what I saw was the green movement being entirely sucked into this way of seeing. And I became a, I became a greener years ago because I was entranced by the small is beautiful model that the Greens used to believe in in the 70s. When I was a little boy, you know, the, the world of E.F. E. Schumacher and Leopold Kaur and Gandhi and Tolstoy and, and everyone else who told us to live within natural limits in a, in a way that would actually be nourishing to us. Um, and the Green Movement instead bought into this machine thinking in which it saw climate change and other issues as technological problems to be solved with more technology, all of which sucks us into the same project of busting down limits. So now environmentalism has become a, a question of how many wind farms you can get up and whether you should use nuclear power and GM crops to, uh, and whether you should do X, Y and Z to effectively create a, quote, sustainable limitless machine world. Um, all paths kind of lead back to this modern way of seeing almost every question. I mean, Mary comes at this from, a, from, from in, as far as I can see, from the angle of, you know, from the feminist angle. But as she says, it's it's the same question, actually. You can just approach it in, from all of your different sort of personal perspectives. And it all leads you back to this attitude we have to nature and human nature. Yeah, I agree. I, I suppose I, I sort of come, I found myself coming at it from the perspective of the things that you can't say from within that model um, and rather direct experience, uh, particularly of what it is about being a mother that you can't put into words from within the model. And I've, I've theorized, I've borrowed from Heidegger elsewhere to frame this in terms of, you know, of what, what you call the machine pool. See, it wants to turn everything into standing reserve. You know, it wants to, it wants to enclose everything. You know, it started with the commons and then it started patenting things. And now it's moving on to patenting people's bodies and um, genetic sequences. And, you know, but, it, but it wants to it wants to move things from being uh, naturally occurring sort of biosemiotic you know, relationships with one another to being um, inert resources that can be instrumentalized and ideally commodified and um, t- turned into turned into something that can be used for something and sort of unmoored from its relational context. That's the basic movement, unmoor something from its relational context and then turn it into things which can be traded back and forth in a sort of liquid and limitless way. So if that's the basic model, the problem with that from the perspective of a feminist and a mother is that everything everything that matters, everything that's important about being a mother is impossible, you can't, is, is not visible within that model. Um, because all all of mothering is about pattern and all of mothering is about repetition you know it's about turn, it's about showing up for your baby every day um, in all the little ways that are important because the baby's completely dependent on you and all the all the things which are nice about it are impossible to frame in those in terms of the machine because they can't be commodified I mean you know it's easy to sort of wax sentimental about your baby's first laugh um, but yeah I've, I've, I've I think a lot of mothers will relate to the experience of getting to the end of the day and having had actually a lovely day, but then somebody asks them, oh, what did you do today? And you, 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 you can't say, mm. you, you just can't sum it up because you did stuff and you were there and it was in the moment and just the, the, the day went by and bits of it were probably really boring. But if you try and explain it to somebody from, from the perspective that's outside the relationship and that sort of dynamic business of kind of sustaining a uh, tiny dependent person if you like with the with the energy and your your, with with your own body and your own way of being in the world um and you try and explain that sort of dynamic activity um to somebody who isn't part of it and who isn't in those relationships with you they'll just be like well that sounds pretty dull and repetitive and it kind of is you know i mean if you have a if you have a functioning brain and an education it does get boring after a bit but it's also really important and it's also really lovely and i mean this is you know as somebody with a functioning brain and an education and also a deep deep love of my daughter these are all things which i've kind of wrestled with and found myself theorizing as well as doing um and i've and i've come to realize that it's it's another it's another angle on the same problem that i think paul is wrestling with which is about how the things the things which matter and the things which sustain us and the things which are meaning making and the things which are genuinely sustainable and create sustainable life in relation to other life are all pattern based. Then none of them are none of them are information based. They're all meaning based. And information, if you like, is blind to meaning because meaning all, meaning inheres in pattern and repetition and the everyday and the ordinary and the relational 
And the moment you turn it into standing reserve, the moment you enclose it, instrumentalize it and send it out as inert stuff to be liquefied in one sort of a market or another, um, it it becomes information and it stops being meaningful. The moment you commodify a child that um, I mean, you you understand, you understand where I'm going. Yeah, and we we are there, aren't we? We are pretty much commodifying children already. Yes, we are literally commodifying children. There's a whole there are rows and rows of cots in bomb shelters in Ukraine where children which were commissioned by parents elsewhere in a rented uterus uh, are waiting for their commissioning parents to come and collect them. I say parents in the loosest possible sense. This is not this is not a form of parenthood, which I recognize as such. Um, But yes, we are commodifying children at this point. We're commodifying everything. And I think that that the, the notion of enclosure is really important. I keep coming back to this one as well again and again and again. I mean, you could argue that this whole process begins literally with the enclosures, land enclosures in in, in Britain in from the say the 15th century onwards and you know gl- global capitalism if you like global industrialism is a process of enclosing everything so you start off with the land then you go on to the the, the workers then you then you go on to the human body you go on to the natural world everything's enclosed and it's also a it's also a process of making everybody rootless and making everything rootless it's all it's, it's about uh, if, if Mary talks about relationships I suppose I talk about roots which is pretty much a different way of saying the same thing if you're rooted in a place, if you're rooted in your relationship with a family, if you're rooted in, in your own body, if you're rooted in, in the environment around you, then you have something which, as Mary says, you can't actually commodify. You can't commodify that sense of, of being. Um, you, uh, well, you can, but <laughs> and they do. But in, in the real sense of what it actually means to be human, it's not measurable. But everything has to be measurable in the age of the machine. It has to be measurable. It has to be commodifiable. It has to be profitable. Uh, because that's the only way we can measure whether we're progressing. And of course, we must always progress towards something better by enclosing and by uprooting and by turning everything into a standing reserve. And that actually breaks the, the business of being human in the world. It breaks. I mean, you talk a lot about sense making, David, and you can't sense make if, if you can't make sense of any of these relationships if they've been broken. And I do think that so much of the kind of madness in the culture at the moment, apart from being driven by social media, is also just actually being driven by the destruction of things which for millennia we've thought were completely normal, including what motherhood is and what fatherhood is and what families are and what it means to be in a place. All of this kind of stuff that nobody had to question much. Now suddenly everything has to be questioned. Mm. And there aren't really answers because it doesn't make sense. Yeah, I want to... It's a good question and I wonder whether this is going to help make more sense or less sense, bringing in the sort of metaphysical dimension because you both talk about this and the concept that people may or may not be familiar with, the, uh, the, the kind of Gnosticism, the idea that this is a very deep-rooted pattern of thinking where the real world is somehow fake, is somehow kind of an illusion, and actually there's a sort of inner essence that is real, is sort of very much mimicked. I think both of you have referred to this in your writings, it's kind of mimicked in the way that our attitude to the world now seems to be. And so I wonder, do you, do you think that kind of, I'd love to hear about the sort of the metaphysical frame that you are both bringing and also whether you think that that kind of makes things more intelligible or less. Well, I've, I've used the, well, I used the phrase fully automated luxury Gnosticism uh, with sli- slightly flippantly. I borrowed it from Aaron Bastani's book, Fully Automated Luxury Communism, where he, he imagines that actually left wing utopia is going to be attained by the automation of everything. And presumably the liquefaction transition translation of everything into standing reserve, which is just going to bring about a world of eternal abundance for everyone somehow. I haven't, with apologies to Bastani, I have not actually read the book, but I gather that that's the gist of it. Um, fully automated luxury communism. So I, so and I, I borrowed that for fully fully automated luxury gnosticism, which is, well, I. I don't believe it's coming, um, but I think it's a it's an aspiration which is being sold to us. Um, of which the reality is perhaps less appealing. If you like, it's fully automated luxury Gnosticism is the kind of high sounding promise that we're all going to be able to escape the constraints of our body into something, into into a miraculous world where really we can do anything, whether that's the metaverse and with, with a haptic interface that means somehow we can see and feel and touch and taste things in this imaginary digitally constructed world. And we'll never actually need to have any kind of reference back to what's happening in our physical 
um, in the physical plane at all, or you know, all in, in any number of other sort of techno fixes for the problems of materiality and the problems of embodiment. Um, I suppose it's one of those things where I sort of meme first and ask questions later, um, or decide what it is I mean by it <laughs> later. A good principle. <laughs> well, I mean, you often end up. I mean, I started. I did that with reactionary feminism as well, and it's, it's completely turned into a thing. So um, sometimes, sometimes it's just a good, good to go, good to walk backwards for a bit and see where you end up. So, yeah, I mean, but Paul, Paul, fully automated luxury Gnosticism. You know, can we can we fully automate it? How luxurious will it be? You know, how Gnostic is it? Yeah, it's a great. Place, isn't <laughs> Over it? to you. Um, it is interesting that this there's no, the notion of Gnosticism is floating around a bit at the moment. So. Historically, the, the Gnostic movement um, was, a, was a sort of very loose collection of, of beliefs that were around in the early centuries of the Christian church. And the Christian church declared them heretical because effectively Gnosticism says, as you suggest, David, that this world is either, is either fake or it's something to be transcended. So what you do with, I mean, Gnosis literally means knowledge. It means a kind of secret knowledge. So the, the Gnostic movement is, uh, is pr promoted and still promotes actually the idea that you can escape the body in the physical realm if you have the right kind of secret knowledge and the christians said and say that this is a heresy because christianity is embodied just as christ was a, a, a kind of melding of the human and the divine that's what we are and so christianity is not um the the, the christian claim is not that we're going to escape from physical reality and float off to somewhere better it's that physical reality can be transformed whereas the gnostics say no this is basically a hell and the Gnostic tradition also has the um, has this great notion of the demiurge. There's a, a, an evil being who thinks he's God, and he is the one who has created matter. And so matter is inherently evil. And so the human spirit is a divine spark trapped in matter, and we all want to escape from it back to the back to the, the the place where we belong. So it's not much of a leap from that to to Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse. It's not much of a leap from that to what Silicon Valley is doing. I mean, openly doing and openly talking about, which is attempting to transcend the messy horribleness of physical reality so that we don't have to die, so that we don't have to give birth, so that we don't have to be the sex that we were born, so that we don't have to be anything that's actually re relational and anything that limits what we imagine our free will is. Um, this is my, my daughter visiting the podcast there because um, it's so interesting. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, and, and it is exactly that that's the Gnostic promise today. And it's uh, it's the notion that, it, the, the, phys the physical reality of stuff is escapable, but this time we're not doing it through secret Gnostic religious knowledge. We're doing it through technology, which is our equivalent of that. Um, and it's no joke to say that this is exactly where the project is headed. You only have to listen to Ray Kurzweil speaking or any of these other guys in Silicon Valley, Elon Musk or any of them. They're very open about this. It's the, it's the great dream of where we're supposed to end up. And I think Mary's right. We're not going to get there because of all sorts of actual physical realities that are going to get in the way. But I think we're going to do a lot of damage as we attempt to. And I also think it's an elite project. You know, it's, it's not something that's available to the majority of humanity. This is, you know, this is something you do in your New Zealand bunker primarily. Well, there are some there are elite photographs doing the rounds of people where you know homeless guys with metaverse goggles on. And oh, actually, that's, that's, that's good. It's, it's egalitarian at least. Right, right, right. Also, an incredibly bleak advert for the metaverse itself, mm -hmm. um, which I, I think accidentally says the quiet part out loud, where some washed up old dog who used to have a great life being the life and soul of the party or, you know, loved and surrounded by friends and is now lonely and, you know, doesn't and lives on his own and is miserable and, you know, basically has a crap life. Um, and it comes into the metaverse and just makes it all come back again, but fictionally and digitally created. And that's a happy ending to the story. Um, where, in fact, what the advert is saying very clearly is if you have a shit life, come and sit in the metaverse and you can pretend it's not so shit. You can improve it. And it's, you know what it always strikes This me is good news, people. apparently. Yeah, I mean, this is like the Matrix written from the point of view of a, a, a script in which Agent Smith is the good guy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> where we are but we've been we're 20 years on we're 20 years on and we've just we're telling the same story but now it's good news yeah right and as you Mary. said I don't, I don't actually think we're going to get there because it's so somebody still has to take the bins out bluntly i mean this this again is the feminist point you know somebody still has to do the dishes and even if it's a machine does the dishes someone still has to unload the dishwasher uh, you know, soon it, it 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 is eventually turtles all the way down. Somebody still has to grow the food. Mm. 
and and all of and even if you build robots to grow the food somebody's got to service the robots and then somebody's got to do the dishes for them somewhere at the bottom is somebody doing the dishes mm. um, and they're probably not in the metaverse while they're doing the dishes um, so yeah it's an elite project at the end of the day and someone somewhere is cleaning up the rubbish that's left behind after the big party <laughs> Yeah, and you had a really interesting insight as well that there's a kind of the, the mimetic warfare that goes alongside it, or the information warfare that goes alongside it seems to be more and more about any kind of hint of um, fixity or reality is now called essentialism, is now kind of to be attacked mimetically, I guess. And that that I find a really well, interesting well, development. Fascism, not just essentialism, it's fascism. Eco-fascism. To, to, to state that limits exist and continue to exist no matter how hard you push against them is, is, now, is now framed straightforwardly as fascist. You know, even if you're just observing something which is there, you know, the, the act of noticing it is makes you crypto-fascist. Yeah, it's a very, very interesting one, this, this whole notion of essentialism. Um, which has become such a boo word on the left, and as Mary says, very quickly becomes an accusation of fascism. Um, apart from being a s- stupid representation of actually what fascism is, it's just very, it's very telling that the 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 people who use that language, who are always self uh, self titled progressives, believe that, as you say, any any kind of limits, any kind of actual roots in the natural world, is. <laughs> Is not only evil, but is somehow associated with the, like the worst political project in human history, and it's you know it's not it's not just it's not even just a smear. It's like there's a real belief in this. You know, there's there's a real sense that if you are talking about limits being either even real or beneficial, or having to live within say your own body or live with the natural world as it is or whatever it is, then you are somehow pushing at the door of some kind of yeah vicious ethnocentric racial warfare whatever it is and it's like uh, it's, it's almost like people have had their minds bent by the machine to believe that if you actually have to live within the, the the god-given limits of nature or if you even use a phrase like that then you know you're such a troubling person that you have to be removed so who's left the only people who are left are people who believe there are no limits at all uh, and, and in this kind of merger of uh, i suppose progressive left ideology and machine Gnosticism. It's very weird, and it's happening very quickly as well. And it's almost impossible in some cases to have conversations, um, you know, about this without, as Mary says, having the having the F word thrown at you. Which is, um, yeah, again, I think in other in in other maybe more sane parts of the world and in other more sane times, these conversations are possible. They were possible five years ago, ten years ago. You know, you could sit around talking about Aldous Huxley, and there would be no problem. But suddenly, it's, it's accelerated into a very strange place. I mean, it does. It depends a little bit where you stand and and who you're speaking to. I, mean, I think just a, a very immediate example. My my very good friend Louise Perry, who's recently written a book about uh, the case against the sexual revolution, in which she argues for. I mean, her her background is as a broadly left liberal feminist, um, who's sort of but but working work but worked in a rape shelter and found, left her questioning a lot of a lot of what she had internalized about what the sexual revolution meant, who it was for and what it was actually doing. And so she's written a whole book about her her perspective on this with chapter titles that I would think sort of would have been, as you say, five years ago, very difficult to argue with. Like loveless sex is not empowering. People are not commodities. You know, listen to your mother, all sort of fairly, fairly sensible, you would think, straightforward statements to make. Um, and somebody, somebody of, you know, within within the academy um, posted the, the screenshot of, of her chapter headings today saying this is a real mask off moment you know look at this look at the horrors which are which are coming forth from the, you know the various other sort of imputations of the f word um and, and i mean but the but, but and was then then received quite a lot of replies to the effect of which bit of people are not commodities are you objecting mm-hmm. to there mate right? um, I mean, really really the response was though there is nothing here that any of us disagree with you know this is actually not really this is this is this all sounds very sensible um which which indeed it does um you know loveless sex really is not empowering certainly not to women anyway um but um, but there are I, I suppose what i'm trying to say is there are a lot of people out there who see this stuff um and and feel endlessly wordlessly frustrated with this stuff mm-hmm. Um, and and don't and just just aren't really sure how to mobilize 
against this stuff because it's because the the, the sort of integrated mes messaging apparatus which is transmitting it seems seems very well articulated and very very sort of all encompassing but actually it isn't mm. actually it isn't can, things creep through the cracks yeah. people still have eyes and functioning brains because because this would yeah, be a not, sort of pushback sorry to interrupt this would be a sort of pushback i think saying well maybe there are because with social media especially it's very easy to make any kind of case and say well everyone thinks this when actually maybe it's just a few people because the pushback would be okay maybe there's a few people who are kind of saying that this person's a fascist for for asserting that there are kind of gender roles or whatever um but is this not is this not kind of nut picking um kind of extreme examples rather than kind of a, a wider mood or a wider kind of feeling well i think the sort of I, I would say there's two ways of looking at that um it's very difficult to discern what public opinion actually is now because twitter both is and is not the real world um and you know and also you know there are i think you can you can argue about how how impactful a silent majority actually is um compared to the concerted efforts of a very small group of extremely committed zealots which you know, I think if you look at history, it tend to be more effective than any any amount of silent majority. So, so from that perspective, you know, the cards are the cards are stacked in favour of the fully automated luxury gnostics because they have the mic and they really, really, really believe this stuff. But I don't know. I think there are. I think there. I really think there are hard limits to it. You know, there are hard limits to how how much women. As, as has been very abundantly evident in Britain recently and increasingly so in America too, there are limits to how much women will tolerate being told that a woman is anybody who says they're a woman, for example, you know, which is, which is the most egregious and the most in your face um, battlefront in, the, in, in the, the push for no limits whatsoever on in turn, in individual self-actualization on any terms whatsoever. That's the most sort of uh, that, that that's the most egregious um, front in in that particular. But I mean, there are there are many others, um, but it's also it's also the one which is mobilising the most sort of cross party resistance. Because the, I mean, if you've grown a, if you've grown a new human inside your literal uterus, you know what a woman is, and it's also notable how many of the people, how many of the men who pay lip service to this idea that a woman is anybody who says they're a woman immediately knows what a woman is the moment they want to rent a uterus. You know, there are this, 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 all, all this stuff is very it's it's full of slippages and it's full of bad faith and it's full of inconsistency. And everybody knows that to be the case, because at the end of the day, you know, the the liquefaction of everything. I, 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 I've just been writing a chapter about this, actually. You know, the, the, this, the, the liquefaction of everything doesn't actually work because it, because it's premised on the idea that there's no such thing as nature and no such thing as human nature. And that's not actually true. So what it does in the end is it, 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 it successfully liquefies all of the norms or all, all of these sort of established structures. But because, because no, human nature continues to exist, it then it, it simply reframes that as a set of supply and demand problems. So instead of, instead of having, you know, codes for, for in, instead of having courtship, rituals you have the sexual marketplace and that's a straightforward reordering of the the sexed differences between men and women you know which you know had quite elaborate social codes ordered around them you know in order to kind of balance the balance the interests of men and women you know under particular economic circumstances you liquefy that you blow it all out of the water and say no actually everybody can just do what they want now um, but and what what happens is not that everybody does what they want exactly what happened because people still people still have urges which are not rational and some of those are connected to our reproductive roles they they just are um but but instead but and because this stuff goes on existing it just it just gets reabsorbed into the marketplace and it becomes a set of supply and demand problems um and the same the same is now happening with biological sex you know it's either being you know the desire to be one sex or another is being is being reimagined as a set of supply and demand problems you know there are already medical papers out there you know talking about you know uterus transplants into men who men who identify as women i don't know where they're going to get the uteruses from but presumably from from women who identify as men or i mean who knows who knows anyway there's a, the, this this is being imagined as you know a set of lego parts that could just be swapped so that they're in the right place presumably through some sort of marketplace and the same goes again for babies you know women are still the only people who can just new humans um so so here again um because we we're, we're in the process of liquefying all of the norms and 
um, but but we haven't in the process successfully managed to abolish the underlying material facts you know on on which those norms are built um, we just end up we, we we end up reimagining them as a set of supply and demand problems so now if you need a uterus you just go and rent one um, and but and but but the point is the liquefaction doesn't work and so the and and the and, and my my sense is there's a that there's a kind of frustration there among the automated luxury gnostics because every time they try and every time they try and get to the bottom to the point where actually we really have just attained full grey goo satanism um, it just it n- never quite works because it's because there's always there's always another level of materiality which has its patterns and continues to be what it is um, and and I. It's a very depressing, very pessimistic sort of a hope, but I do, I, I have some, you know, if I have hope, it's in the fact that, that that persists. It just is. And it doesn't matter how many times you try and liquefy it, it continues. Yeah, and I think that's really, that's a great summary of it all. I mean, this is, um, I've written quite a few times in these essays I'm doing at the moment about the, how revolutions effectively, especially progressive revolutions, always clear the ground for the machine. Um, they think they're creating a utopia, and what actually happens from the French Revolution onwards is you destroy all the customary structures, you destroy the traditions, you destroy the structures from families to community level structures up to church level. You you, you literally you, you you know you burn down the churches and you try to destroy the family and you redistribute the land. And what happens then is you just create a void, and into the void commerce rushes. And so, as Mary says, everything becomes commodified. And so, the result of your grand utopian progressive revolution is not. A fairer world. It's effectively a world that is more commodified, more individualistic, um, and more more prey to the machine. And that brings us to the point after about two hundred years that we've got to now, where everything is a commodity. But there are a lot of people who consider themselves to be progressive who have confused that with liberation. And and this is really what liberation has come down to, as Mary is also saying better than me, is is liberation from nature at all levels, liberation from the body, liberation from everything around you, and. This, uh, this, I think, explains the kind of the people who scream about fascism and the people who are so committed to this is they genuinely think, well, effectively, they're blank slatists, right? They genuinely believe that if you can remove all of the supposed change that tie us down from, from the, the reality of biological sex to the existence of family, to national culture, to whatever it is that you, you think is getting in the way of, of, of equality and utopia, then we're all then we're all the same. And then we can indeed all choose to have babies or to be men or to be women or to live anywhere or to be whatever we want. But that's not true because we're hefted, you know, we're hefted and we're rooted in, in whatever cultural or, or background or biology we have. And there are some things you shouldn't, you can't get away from, but also you shouldn't want to because they actually make you human. And, and, that, and that's the thing that there's this notion that these structures that have always in most societies and most times been customary from the family to uh, the village, to the religious institution, whatever it is that they are bad things which which limit us as as opposed to the possibility that they are actually things which enrich us and which structure our urges in useful ways um and that's that's the point we're going to have to probably painfully rediscover that we we probably built these structures for a reason and we lived in certain ways for a reason and however imperfect those ways might have been for lots of people and they're hardly unimprovable they still probably built on a knowledge of human nature that we're now pretending isn't there anymore and uh, yeah, we're, we're getting to the point where we've deconstructed almost everything. And as Mary said, there's a kind of, <laughs> there's, a, there's a grinning face at the bottom of it. It's not looking good. Yeah, I've come, I've come gradually to the conclusion that actually gender ideology is mostly, particularly transgender children, um, it's, are, are being instrumentalised. You know, there, there are some seriously distressed people. Um, who are for for all, all man, or a number a range of different often quite complicated you know personally very painful reasons you know deeply unhappy in their bodies and in the world as it is you know and I, I think that's that's often a rational response to finding themselves in a very in an absolutely intolerable place you know particularly adolescent women um, who find themselves in a world so saturated with porn that actually to me it seems a completely reasonable response to take hormones that make that make you resemble a male and cut off your breasts. I mean, I I, I would probably be tempted if I were 14 today. So you know, from from that point of view, I have no I have no beef with with people who are trying to find some relief. 
in 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 a in a embodied condition that they find intolerable you know that that's not who i pick a fight with mm-hmm. but what what i see is a, a subset of very distressed people who are being instrumentalized in pursuit of a much bigger project which is the deregulation of human nature as such if you like the deregulation of the, of the human body you know much the same way as the financial sector was deregulated in the 1980s the, the aim is to deregulate the body yeah, and to really deregulate really the really idea that we have that the body has a nature, because that opens that opens up a com- boundless commercial sphere in which, you know, organs regenerate self regenerating organs can be synthesized in laboratories. Human animal chimeras can be developed for who knows what purposes. I mean, you know, the possibilities are endless if you're a mad scientist with no no ethics. But you have to yeah. you have to render an inexcusably low status any sort of you know, the, the currently still pervasive common conviction act with the truth in fact not conviction truth that humans have a nature mm-hmm. and that you know males are normatively one way and females are normatively another and you know humans have a normal a number of limbs and so on and so forth you have to you have to completely denormalize destabilize and liquefy that consensus before you before you can embark on the you know deregulatory business opportunities that flow from that yeah yeah no i think that's right that's exactly what's happening um and the, the the demonizing of the uh, of the turfs and the fascists and everybody else is precisely part of that project, which is to to silence and to provide endless new names for the people who are saying exactly that. It's really interesting what you were saying about the like what is the sort of the the question that arises of like what's the most fundamental driver? Because you you mentioned Paul that you felt like commerce was filling the gap of this sort of revolutionary moment. But are you saying that you think commerce is is actually the driver or is the driver deeper? Is the driver some kind of, I mean, you've called it the machine, but how, where do you think that machine lives? Do you think it's kind of a psychological structure or a, um, yeah, what, what, what do you think is actually, because it's also kind of, for me, kind of maps onto some of the conspiracy thinking as well, where I, I see a lot of the time people kind of collapse around looking for an agent, a specific agent or a specific set of agents, whereas actually there is a sort of tendency towards often that seems deeper. So where where do you locate those those drivers? Yeah, well, I have a terrible feeling that the driver is metaphysical. I mean, this is not just about making money. Um, there's a lot of interest in that. But there's, uh, I, keep, I always talk about this fascinating book by Kevin Kelly called What Technology Wants, which is a really good book to read. Um, you should read it, Mary, if you haven't already. It's a few years old now, but it's um, Kevin Kelly's one of the Silicon Valley guys, and he's 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 very much into the notion that something is being created, which he calls the technium, which is pretty much the same as I suppose what I'm calling the machine. Um, and he says, look, this thing is becoming self-aware, and that's the point, right? It's starting to manage itself. It's starting to push its own direction. It's starting to um, starting to manifest and and this is again the attitude of a lot of the guys behind this project that they think they're creating the next they think they're building the next level of evolutionary consciousness you know this is why they're so obsessed at the moment i think with artificial intelligence they really think they can create post humans and they they think perhaps this is kevin kelly's explicit notion that humanity is just a stepping stone on the on the on the way to something greater a greater consciousness that they're helping to build but which is also weirdly manifesting through them so it's a it's a very quasi religious thing that is happening. I'm not saying everybody involved in it believes that. There's a lot of profiteering, just and and a lot of kind of mind just following the herd. But there's something going on with the creation of this post human metaverse machine uh, machine machinist um, sort of post human anti human non human uh, world in which it literally is. It's a metaphysical project in which they're trying to recreate or or build a heaven on earth entirely reconstructed i mean you hear it a lot when people talk about how they want to go and live in they want to terraform mars or they want to fly off and, and, and live on on moon bases because that's the fantasy it's the explicit fantasy of how they can create an entire planet right from the right from the dust up in their own image so there's something in it that is um that is very much bigger than just a kind of profit scrabble there's there's a, there's a and again you don't need a you don't need a conspiracy theory in which there are six evil people in a bunker making a plan you just need enough people to buy into something which is moving already, which I think is where we're going. And it's kind of the inevitable 
result of the whole attitude, the whole worldview of modernity, I think, to come back to what we started with, with the, the notion of the rational individual who can detach himself from nature and, and, and build his own paradise. Now we've got the technology to do it, or we will have soon. And that's really what encompasses the whole thing, I think. So it's, a, it's an ideology or even a, a religious worldview that drives it, I think. You say, I feel like you're sidling along the edge of implying that it's not so much that we have ideas as that ideas have us. Um, yeah, well, I think that's true. Um, I suppose. Yeah, that's not a bad way of putting it. It's um, we are. I mean, I, I think you see this really manifesting on social media. It's one reason I don't have any social media accounts. It's um, people are being entirely controlled by by ideas and, and by visions and by ideologies or whatever these things are. They're not, you know, the, the great the, the, the famous I support the current thing meme. Is, is quite funny, but it's also, it also has a kind of deeper meaning to it, which is that, you know, there's, you, you know you're being controlled when, you, when you're on your smartphone looking at this stuff. You can feel it. Um, and so, yeah, ideas have us, memes have us, metaphysics have us entirely, I think. Uh, and, and, that, and, that, and they can almost become self-replicating in the, age of, in the age of the machine, and they are. I would, I would agree with that. Um... I mean, I'm, I'm hopelessly compromised in that way, Paul. I'm, 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 I'm th- f- fully, fully cognizant of my cyborg state. Well, you're you're I so think... good at memeing, Mary. It would be a shame if you, uh, you know, if you stopped. <laughs> well, you can't be completely unplugged if you've noticed that. Uh, no, I'm not completely unplugged. No, I do, I do pop in here and there. And you know, one of the reasons I don't have social media is that I know very well because I did have a Twitter account for for a while years ago. That I know very well that I would get tempted to start doing exactly the same thing. I'd get sucked into that really easily. It's not, a, it's not a Puritan position so much as a practical one. I know it would rot my brain, so I keep away. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm very ambivalent about my own relationship to Twitter. Um, but one, the, I suppose the thing I wanted to lob in here, um, which is it's a conversation I've had a number of times with you know, other people who are sort of you know, embedded in, this, in this, the cyborg memeplex, as I am, um, who will who'll, who'll cheerfully chat to you about the fact that they know perfectly well that the memeplex that you see on the internet is, you know, the, the, the memeplex is real, but the, what you, the simulacrum of it you see on the internet is not, is not the thing. And who can, who can see the difference very clearly. Now I suspect that there, there are a lot of people who support the current thing. who can't see the difference, but there are, there, there are a surprising number of people out there who see what the, what the internet memeplex is a metaphor for and recognize that it actually exists and is out there. See what it's a metaphor for. What, are the, what do you mean by that? What are, what's the, well, what's the I mean, it's, it's actually it, what it's a metaphor for is the thing that we started off talking about. You know, when you when you were referenced, I was talking about patterns and meanings and the relational, um, the, the relational nature of everything in 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 human culture and the natural world. Um, we had another person. If we're, if we're, well, we're talking about you know people, shadow people who should be part of this conversation. You know, a, a, de- a dear friend of mine, Wendy Wheeler, who died a couple of years ago, um, who was a pioneer in biosemiotics, wrote a lot about um, her work. Was very it was multidisciplinary, and it crossed and it, it was based on the thesis that um, everything in the natural world is not it's not based on information. It's based on meaning. Everything in the natural world is a series of relational dialogues between different meaning making systems um when I, which i found an incredibly illuminating way of thinking about how how organisms exist in relation to one another um but i think there were one of the classic examples is you know that there's a lovely video about this somewhere on the internet of what happened what happened when they reintroduced wolves into so into a national park in America and through a, a, a concatenating series of impacts that re- reintroducing the apex predator had on various various natural systems through the sort of you know concatenating interrelations of these various systems it ended up changing the path of the rivers that ran through the ran through the nature reserve because you know, because some wolves ate some more some more large animals there were, there were there was a different sort of vegetation and that meant smaller animals went over there instead and that in turn meant something else and something else and something else and eventually the rivers changed course and and that that's what i mean when i say that the memeplex is real because in a sense, the normative pattern behaviors of each of these species acting in relationship to one another, you know, acts like a series. It's, it's metaphorically speaking, you could say it's a series of means that, that, that exist in dynamic dialogue with one another. Um, and in the course of doing that, you know, they, um, that, that process, if you like, manifests in, in what we see materially in the natural world. 
Um, and I, I suppose that's probably that's probably the clearest articulation I can give of what I think the actual memeplex is. And that's and that memeplex, if you like, the, the actual memeplex is not one in which humans exist as separate from the natural world, because obviously we're we're having impact on the natural world all of the time. I suppose one of the I, I keep chickens at home. So stop me if this is getting getting too weird or too um, lateral for you. I, I keep chickens. I think a lot about chickens because I like chickens. You know, they're they're kind of psychopathic and they're kind of type miniature dinosaurs and other things. Um, but but they're also one of the, the most successful bird species. On I think they might be the most successful bird species on the planet. And they've done that by existing in a dialogue with humans. You know, they're not the only domesticated animal in that way. And obviously, a lot of them have to take one for the team. But, you know, at a species level, it's a very effective survival strategy. Um, you know, I think there are there are countless billions of chickens in the world and it works from us from a species point of view. But, um, you know, unless unless you're a you're a fully paid up member of the machine and you want to keep you want to keep chickens in battery farms. You know, if you're if you're keeping if, if you're keeping animals like that, you sort of you have to you have to do so roughly in accordance with their nature. Um, you, you can you can exist in a functional, you know, ongoing, sustainable dialogue with a domestic animal. But you know, unless you unless you imprison them and and doctor them in various ways to make them tolerate it, you have to you have to keep them in conditions where they can scratch, for example, if they're chickens or if, if they're if they're sheep, they need different conditions. And so so there's a there's a kind of ongoing dynamic relationship where you know the where animal animal husbandry is partly about meeting the animal where it is, and it's partly about uh, partly about how a domestic animal as a species level responds to that. You know, and over time, you know, specialist breeds evolve and. You know, there are there are partic- different types of so sorry, I'm I'm probably getting very arcane with this, but it's just, you know, once you get into the you know, the, the, the semiotics of of human animal interactions, you know, it's just boundlessly rich terrain. But, you know, there are there are there are differences in how good at giving birth unaided um different different breeds of sheep are. Because I, I think it's I'm trying to I think it's the herdwicks, which are which are normally kept on very barren upland terrain in the in the north of England and because you you just can't get up there during lambing season basically the ones the ones that survive are the ones who can give birth without any help and there are other breeds of sheep which are kept in lowland territory under much closer watch um who are who who generally need help a lot more help with lambing because they over time they've just evolved that way and you you can see you can see how that would work you know the herdwicks the, the herdwicks that make it are the ones are the offspring of, of mothers of ewes that can that can give birth on their own and and just over time they've got much better at it and there are other breeds of sheep which are, which are, which aren't and and these are these are the sorts of dynamic um, interactions between humans and the animal kingdom or and and, and i mean you, you can you can point at any number of different examples i think there's a another one which i really like is the north american peppered moth which over the last 100 years has become it's become darker as a consequence of evolving um, in much more polluted conditions, it used to be it used to be mostly white. Uh, I think some of them then then they have they have different patterns, and, and over over the last hundred years they've become darker um, because the human influence on their environment has 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 made for has has meant they need a different color of camouflage in order to survive. So so we're constantly existing in dialogue with the natural world, you know, with this sort of memeplex, and I think the the fundamental fantasy of the machine that we're somehow separable from it and entitled to instrumentalize it. You know, once you, if you look at it from inside the memeplex or you look at it from a perspective of thinking about us as participants in this and entangled in this enormous sort of multi-species, interspecies memeplex, it, it, it's, it's a sort of monstrous imposition and just a, a fundamental category error. Yeah, and this, um, this takes me right back to the, point about environmentalism that we talked about right at the beginning really where i come in i suppose you know this is a sort of uh, a conversation about gaia theory really this is a conversation about the interconnectedness of all things and the fact that there's no separation between humans and nature and that we're entirely reliant on everything else but that living in urban interconnected societies we can very easily pretend that that's not true uh, until we start keeping chickens um, or any any number of other things but it is it is exactly why it is impossible for the new metaphysics of the machine to succeed in the end, because what it's trying to do is, as I say, recreate, um, recreate, well, well, to create a new world on the basis that the current world is a standing reserve, on the basis that the current world is just a fake, or not a fake, but a, a, a pure material realm, that there's nothing to it, that there's no consciousness wider than the human mind, that there's no real interconnections, that there's nothing 
um, that there's nothing sacred, that there's nothing higher than us, that there's nothing um, that may be operating outside our purview. And that's not true. And that's not a religious claim either. You can you can read any number of scientific papers these days about the consciousness of trees and the interconnectedness of fungal mycelia and any number of interesting studies which demonstrate that things that are not human tend to be a lot more conscious and interconnected than we might assume in the modern age, which incidentally is something that most indigenous people know instinctively and, and, and traditionally. So that's real. So what we are doing precisely is trying to break apart and instrumentalize and break down into material parts, something which actually is alive that we're part of, which is the, the planet itself. We're playing, well, literally playing God, except God's, God knows what he's doing and we don't. Um, and that's why that's why it hits the buffers and it will keep hitting the buffers. And at the micro level, you know, a human body is a real thing and you can't you can't change it beyond a certain point. And at the macro level, there's something very big and interwoven going on with the planet itself that we don't understand and we can't and we can't fiddle with beyond a certain point. And we're just going to learn it the hard way. That's, that's what's going to happen. We're going to learn it the hard way because we don't want to learn it by paying attention. I wanted to um, throw in a concept around this question of like what's driving it. And I wonder whether you both might have seen this. There's been a lot of talk recently about the kind of concept of the egregore, and which is a sort of idea of maybe we are all, the individual human brain as connected to a smartphone, just choosing to kind of upregulate certain messages or not based on kind of ideological reasons could be seen as a kind of individual neuron in a in a wider sort of group consciousness that we're not we don't know where that is going that that's sort of almost like a that could be do you think that's a useful concept and that could kind of explain sort of a, a kind of wider perspective of 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 a an intention that we're part of but we we don't fully understand where its destination or direction of travel is yeah well it's an, it's an occult concept isn't it Egregor? It's, um it's yeah it, it, i've seen a few people chatting about it recently i mean there's certainly a sense that um it, 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 you can you can come back to that notion that we're we're being controlled by something that's bigger than us and i think fundamentally that is happening through the internet i wrote quite a fun short story a few years ago called the basilisk which was all about this which i quite enjoyed writing i should just write short stories because it's a much quicker way of trying to explain all this than putting it in essays but that was precisely about the note that the, the, the possibility that something is controlling us through through the web whether that something is a sort of a, a mind force that we create in some ways or whether it's something else i don't know but there's something there's something going on which is bigger than us the internet has manifested it uh, and and it's it's part of the craziness and it's um it's very difficult to pin down but it's people talking about egregores is one sort of pointer to the fact that people can again feel that there's something much bigger behind the, the weird on-screen interactions that no one can quite explain or put their finger on. <laughs> well, but I would love to do a part two where we talk about what we're going to do. What, yeah, what we'll, we do now, because we've, we've if we've if we've reached the bottom, if we've reached if we've reached the bottom, and it's really, there really is nowhere further down. I mean, there might be a lot a, a long a long way further down, but if we've if if, if we reach the point where we've liquefied everything, what happens next? I think that's a that's a question I would love to talk over with you. Maybe no, it's a big one. Question. It's a big one. Yeah, how to live through it, how to make sense of it, how to how to resist it. Yeah, that would be a that would be a great chat. Awesome. So this is diagnosis, and then we have a, a follow up with solution. <laughs> <laughs> no promises. No promises. Yeah, that's Mary, awesome. Mary and Paul, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So I hope you enjoyed that. I really loved the conversation while I was part of it and then I listened to it again afterwards and something really landed. So I'm going to try and explain why I think this is significant. Maybe you can let me know what you make of this in the comments. I think what this conversation was is a moving towards a synthesis position between what you might call dissident right and dissident left. It's explaining how the extreme woke agenda is liquefying all structures, which is what the right is angry about. But Paul explains that ultimately this is in the interests of capital and it's a corporate agenda, which is what the left is upset about. And it also validates the feelings of the conspiracy minded that something coordinated is going on, but locates the source of the problem not in a shadowy cabal, but in the metaphysical, what Paul calls the machine and Mary calls fully automated luxury Gnosticism. So I think this is 
inching towards a synthesis position. And what's more powerful is the way that they both deliver their message with wit, intelligence and depth and with none of the reactivity and anger that characterizes so much of this debate. So I really do think this is a step forward and I'm looking forward to hosting them again in dialogue along with Rebel Wisdom members, which we're going to do soon. So if you want to join that conversation, check out the membership options below in the show notes and hope to see you there.